I talk about buying cheap equipment all the time. Well, in this video, we're gonna talk about when you shouldn't buy cheap. So sit down, grab a cup of coffee, and let's talk about when you should actually spend some money on some hi-fi equipment. Most popular topics on my channel have always been speakers and amps. People are interested in turntables. People are also interested in digital streamers. But those are the four products that people really come to see. Not nearly as many people want to learn about headphones because there's so many great headphone channels already out there. Like DMS, like Joshua Valor, like the headphone show. But sometimes I need to talk about some of the other things. These are products that we probably don't think about very often and we definitely don't spend as much time obsessing about them as much as we do the speakers, the amps, the DACs, the turntables. But I think in some cases we should. Let's start off with a real controversial one. A power conditioner. That's right, a power conditioner. Probably not for the reasons why you think a power conditioner should be purchased. I have had over my experience, and I've listened to hundreds of components, and occasionally I have hum. And it's not necessarily because I have dirty power, it's because I have grounding issues occasionally. And a professional level power conditioner, like something from Furman, has sometimes eliminated those ground loop problems. And most of the time, they aren't really as expensive as you think they are. There are some from the likes of AudioQuest that are super expensive, but even AudioQuest has some affordable power conditioners. The ones that I like to buy are from Furman, which is a pro audio brand. I'm looking at the eight outlet model, and at one time I got the for $60, and that price seems to vary on Amazon. You can go over probably to Guitar Center. I know Sweetwater also sells a variation. There's even a $25 one that you can get on Amazon. I personally feel like you should just look at these as a really good power strip. If it does indeed make things sound cleaner, then that's free insurance. You don't need to get one right away, but eventually I think you should pick one up around the $50 to $100 mark, just so that you have the insurance. The peace of mind. Even Emotiva has one and they've dropped the price from $169 to $99. So they're not terribly expensive and I don't think when you spend the money you will ever actually regret it because these things last a lifetime. They'll probably last longer than your actual system. And if they don't, well, they have a warranty. Another divisive topic is cables because people can spend thousands of dollars on cables. I'm not talking about those type of cables. I'm talking about the type of cables that don't fall apart. In my past, I have purchased cables during Black Friday or Prime Day that I thought were a good deal. They had a big markdown. I spent $50 on this Foz Power Cables, bought a whole bunch of them. And guess what? Not a single one of those cables is still used today. I got to the point where I was so angry, I took all of them and I cut them in half so that I would never try to use them again. I buy the world's best cables and they're a little bit more expensive. $27, $25, $92, but be careful because there's other products that try to piggyback on world's best cables now that have kind of similar branding. Make sure you're getting the right ones. Some of them are more expensive. $116 for a five foot length, $60, $30. I buy usually these Canair ones or the Amphenol ones. And some of them come in one and a half foot lengths, which is perfect if you have something, a DAC into a preamp or something like that. So they're perfect sizes. You can get them in different lengths, of course. The reason why I did this though is because in the long run, I was spending more on RCAs than if I just bought a decent product from World's Best Cables. There's another cable that I used, Amazon Basics, but I've changed all my cables over to the World's Best Cables. And what I would do is I'd buy 
a pair or two each month. Well, over a time span of a few months, you'll have enough cables to basically keep you happy. Now my use case scenario is a little bit different than yours because I change things out so often. So it's really important to me to have a really high quality cable, not necessarily from a sonic perspective, but from a beefiness, this isn't going to break perspective. Is there sonic improvements? I don't know. You would have to be the judge of that. I know personally that these are the cables I buy because I like the way they sound and I like the way that they're built. So if you can stretch and spend $100 on cables or even buy a pair of these each month, I think in the long term, you're gonna have a better system. And these have great shielding which means if you're having noise issues in your system, which I've had before, and it was because of an RCA, then buying something like this is going to eliminate that or at least mitigate it. And these are the ones that I put my name on. Not literally. World's Best Cables and the entry-level AudioQuest cables. So they're RCAs, they're optical, coaxial, and HDMI. And I know people say, it's digital, it's ones and zeros. I get it, fine. If you don't think there's a difference, there's not a difference. They're still built really well. So world's best cables, entry level audio quest. If you know some other cables that are really solid, pop them down in the description. Ooh, snake oil cables. They actually built my cheap audio man cables. They're out of California. If you just found the channel, please like this video and subscribe. I do this for a living, so it means the world to me if you would subscribe to the channel. I know most of you that are watching this video aren't actually subscribed, so please do me a favor. Subscribe, like the video. Banana clips or some type of speaker attachment device going from the wire to your speaker. So I'm talking about spades, but mostly I'm talking about banana plugs, banana clips, because that's what I use again my use case scenario may be a little bit different than yours because I'm changing speakers out constantly. It is a pain. If you ever took the end of the speaker cable, twist it just perfect and then put it in the hole and guess what? One strand's gonna get messed up, it's gonna get pushed up, you're gonna end up getting it in there anyway, cranking it down and then you may have, you may run the risk of shorts. Also vintage equipment. Some of the vintage equipment just has push pins. Some of the vintage equipment only has a screw. So what I do is I make spade connectors. There's also a product you can buy for vintage receivers that has a post on one end. So you put that in the push pin area on the back of the receiver. And then it has a little thing that can take a banana plug. You can even get a spade to a banana plug adapter. It makes connections to your vintage equipment and even some new equipment way easier. And I don't think you'll ever regret buying those. $14, $10, even $20 well spent. When I first started the channel, I made a joke about speaker stands. I said, just get bar stools. And I don't necessarily think that's a bad idea still. So I said, a bar stool can do everything a speaker stand can do, but a speaker stand can't do everything a bar stool can do. I still kind of stand behind that. And there probably are some decent options for bar stools out there that can double as a speaker stand but there are also very affordable speaker stands that you can get mono price is the speaker stand that i recommend the most they come in three different heights they have four metal vertical columns that you can fill with kitty litter or steel shot or cornflakes whatever you'd like and then you can also get the little furniture bumpers that you can put in between there. There's also some fancy rubber things that you could stick in there, further isolating the speaker from the stand. But I, I kind of poo-pooed speaker stands for a long time until I heard a really good one. And it was really the isoacoustics little mini stands that I got and I heard a big difference with and I'm like, oh, maybe I should be isolating my speakers. Now on a stand on the floor, I don't think it plays nearly as big of a role as putting a speaker on a console with a bunch of other equipment next to it. I think you really wanna isolate that. And if you're on a desk, I think you really wanna isolate your speaker from your desk. But having decent speaker stands is one of those things that you buy once and you just have forever. And the cool thing is you can get a pair of really good stands for 120 bucks. <laughs> I think it's imperative that you get a good rack. Sometimes that rack should be big. Probably want a big rack. Sometimes you don't need a big rack 
and you can get a little rack. Having a high quality rack is going to improve your life for years. I am guilty of putting my equipment, stacking it on top of consoles, just about anywhere that I can fit it. And guess what? The best, quickest way for me to change out equipment is in a decent rack. The best and quickest and most effective way to have great cable management is to have a good rack. Racks can be super expensive, but there are a few options that aren't terribly expensive. There is one that I really wanna get, but I'm, I think it's too expensive. It's the Salamander one. It comes with four vertical threaded stock and then you just twist it up so you get each level exactly where you want it to be. They come in around $700 and I'm thinking to myself, I know what threaded stock costs when I go to the Home Depot and it makes me angry on the inside. However, if you're a little bit into DIY, I think you can actually buy the hardware from the Salamander racks and make your own shelves. So if you want to make them from Baltic birch or plywood or MDF, you have that option and it's going to be significantly lesser expensive, less expensive. The other option is the Vulcan stands. Now, basically they are shelves that are divided by some metal columns. Cool thing about the Vulcan stands is you can change them out. You can get different heights of the columns if for instance, you have a pair of Emotiva DR1 monoblocks that are eight inches high because the bottom shelf will accommodate one of those, the shelf up is not going to. So you can get a different size of column and basically make your bottom two shelves be able to accommodate two huge components. You can also get casters for the Vulcan stands, which has saved me. I used to have them just on posts. and Number one, I ended up chewing up my wood floor because I'd even put them on things so I could kind of slide them in and out, but the poke would always go down because I'd have 200 pounds of equipment on there. Anyway, the casters are the way to go. Do they vibrate? Sure. But for me to be able to just do this with a stand, move things in and out, and then put the stand back has been a huge time saver and a huge frustration saver for me. Spend money on a stand. Get one that you love because you could be using it for 30 years. The stand's probably going to outlast your equipment. But if you're on a budget, there's still decent options out there. I'll link the Vulcan stands. There's even some mono price stands, which aren't as good. But from a design perspective, they're almost identical to the Vulcan stands from Pangea. I'd stick with Pangea, though. Simply because I know that's a U.S. company. Sure, the stands aren't made in the U.S., but they're being designed in the U.S., and it's a great company out of Michigan. Vinyl storage and even CD storage. I know, CD storage racks were completely ubiquitous in the 80s and 90s, and it was almost a... It was almost like showing off your collection. If you had a really good storage rack, you'd have it just be tall you would you'd buy the entertainment centers and they would have built-in vhs and cd storage it was really cool you still need to get those because you don't want your vintage cds at this point now you can probably always replace your cds but if you have some vinyl that you can't get again you want to make sure that you're putting it in a place that is safe there's a variety of things that you can get ikea makes some stuff that people use all the time i am definitely not an expert when it comes to vinyl storage so please put in the comments what you use for vinyl storage and also put in the comments as far as plastic sleeves and stuff we had a whole conversation about it on my patreon zoom meeting one night I kind of glossed over. I was a little bit tired and I don't remember everything that was said, but I know there is basically a workflow that some of these vinyl enthusiasts use to protect their vinyl long term. Not just from putting it on a shelf, but storing it in bags and then putting it on the shelf. I think that is a wise investment and something you're probably not going to regret if you have a sizable vinyl collection, or even if you have a small vinyl collection, but you wanna keep it nice for the rest of your life. And when you have a decent storage system, you're gonna be able to find your music much more easily and enjoy it whenever you want to, instead of searching, searching, searching. Having a solid, organized music storage system, even if it's on a hard drive, 
is really important. So don't be scared to spend a little bit of money on these things because they're going to last you for a long time. It's kind of one of the buy once, cry once scenarios. So if you want to support the channel, you can sign up for Patreon, patreon.com slash cheap audio man. Every Sunday night, we have Patreon only Zooms, Patreon only Discord, Patreon only Facebook group. You can also sign up for Amazon Music, Tidal or Rune, links in the description. Click sign up, you get a free trial. I get a couple of dollars, even if you quit. You can also use the links in the description. Those will be affiliate links, which means if you click and you buy, I do get a commission, but it doesn't cost you any more. So it's a great way to support the channel. You can also, Buy me a cup of coffee. Down at the bottom of the video, there's a thanks button. You can give me a few bucks, but don't feel compelled to buy anything. So, don't binge watch anything on Netflix or Hulu. Binge listen, maybe with your really cool new hi-fi accessories that you're not afraid to spend a little bit more money on, and fill your soul with happiness. With that, I'm Randy, the Cheap Audio Man.